This is the BioCentury Show. Brought to you by BioEquity Europe. BioEquity is Europe's premier international showcase for financial dealmakers and biopharma executives to meet rising biotechs. I'm Steve Usden, BioCentury's Washington editor. I'm speaking today with Paul Stoppel, CEO and chair of Galapagos, a company that, despite its name, is headquartered not off the coast of Ecuador, but in the heart of Europe in Belgium. Dr. Stoffels co-founded Galapagos in 1999 and went on to do a variety of things, including serving as worldwide chairman of pharmaceuticals and chief scientific officer at Johnson & Johnson. He left J&J to take on the task of revitalizing Galapagos about a year ago. Prior to all of that, early in his career, he treated AIDS patients in Africa for four years. That led to a lifelong passion for developing effective AIDS therapies and to addressing global health challenges. Dr. Stoffels, I wanna ask you today for your thoughts about enhancing European competitiveness in biopharma, the upcoming revisions to European pharmaceutical law and global health, some other issues. But um, first I've got questions about Galapagos. You arrived at the company after a, the company experienced a string of setbacks and you very quickly reimagined it, dropping programs in fibrosis and kidney disease, moving into oncology, acquiring capabilities to exploit new modalities. To start with, what, what was the process of devising that new strategy like? How did you decide what areas to abandon and which new directions to take? Uh, thank you. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, thank you, Steve. It took some time, but uh, at the same time, we went fast because the company needed it. Um, and the directions we took were Galapagos was, was all focused on uh, new targets with small molecules. And that's a very long path to success. Typically, it takes 15 years to get to uh, to, to result there. So we needed to accelerate. And um, uh, second, uh, fibrosis is a very challenging disease where targets are not very clear, limited biomarkers. So again, an area where it took a long time to make a breakthrough. And as a company which had these setbacks, we had to revive the company. And then you focus on, first of all, what you're good at, and then what could be new in the company and be very, um, very meaningful. And first, uh, we reduced the pipeline to the immunology pipeline where we had Gisellica, have Gisellica in the market. We have a TIC2, uh, which we're now starting um, phase two studies. And so that is uh, one of our uh, therapeutic fields. The other one was we chose let's move into oncology. But at the same time, if you go into oncology, we wanted to make sure we had fast results, but also transformational results. I have my background in J&J, where I focused on, um, on bringing uh, CAR-T amongst other products. And especially with um, with Carvicti, the company made a huge uh, success uh, in in multiple myeloma, where where from a clinical perspective this was transformational. Learning from that, said if I do something, let's see whether we can bring uh, on top of making transformational CAR Ts also something on on manufacturing, and that's where we went to point of care. Quite a challenging. Uh, um, uh, uh, start, but at the same time, uh, there was a company available, Cellpoint, which had been working for two years on that. And within the first two months, we acquired that company. That's now 12 months ago. And uh, and they just started in the clinic. And today we do uh, car teas in hospitals in three countries, in six sites, decentralized. We do it seven days vein to vein, and we have very nice results. We published already two uh, posters on, on different meetings, one in NHL, one in CLL, with uh, excellent results. So hopefully we can continue to do that. And with that, we launched in oncology. In the meantime, looking at a lot of new uh, business development opportunities, and soon uh, a lot of uh, new activities will follow. But focusing on therapeutic area, oncology, immunology, and started with Cellpoint and Abound, uh, which was the complementary discovery team, uh, which we brought on board and uh, have done a, a lot um, so, in the last so, month. Yeah, it is a lot. And, and I'm really interested in um, cell point and in this idea of bringing CAR T to point of point of care. It seems that there are a lot of challenges there, right? But first of the opportunities, you, you've talked to some of my colleagues about a century in the past about this, and you've said that you think that there are going to be benefits in terms of safety and efficacy from 
um, this kind of po point of care CAR T therapy. Are you seeing those in practice now? Yes, of course, data are initially, we initial data, we have now treated somewhere between 30 and 40 patients and, and, and going. Um, but what was already clear from the academic research in this space is that when you when you use fresh cells, you you seem to have a better expansion in patients. And let's say we have been able to industrialize that and where we are in the hospital, cells are taken, apheresis is done from, from the patient that goes into the incubator. It stays seven days in the incubator and a lot of uh, quality samples are taken, but also the vector is input uh, pu put in and transfection. Seven days later, you have cells. And what we see is that we cannot we can administer lower number of cells and most likely of higher quality. And what happens in patients is significant expansion. And when we use between 30, 50 or 100 million cells, we see up to a billion cells expansion within the first two to three weeks in the patient. That gives that expansion time allows to have uh, a, a uh, time for the immune system to remove cancer cells. And we don't see CRS, uh, at least not serious CRS, not grade three or four. We always see some fever, of course, that is uh, that's part of the, 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 ter the therapy, but it's very well tolerated. And so far, we see very good results also. So it's early, but in the first uh, uh, two dozen patients, we clearly see the benefit of no CRS, good clinical result. And we and consistently see, can see it. cytokine re release syndrome, yeah. Yeah, cytokine release uh, syndrome, yes. So, so is there a clear um, regulatory pathway to to the getting a decentralized therapy like this approved? You know, presumably you're going to have some way of standardizing manufacturing across sites. Well, let me start with that. The the production is highly standardized. The quality testing is the quality release testing is highly standardized, and the monitoring is both the oversight and monitoring are local, but also central. We as a company over oversee all of the production because it's it's an integration of a biological incubator, but also a a very uh, good data system and digital system capturing all the data including the manufacturing data, the quality data, the quality release data, which allows us to give good oversight. Of course, it are GMP sites, so local GMP. We do the training, we uh, we, we validate and we uh, we do the SOPs, the training, the GMP. Um, the incubator is end-to-end -end sterile, so minimum handling. And then also the testing for quality release, we are standardizing step by step every test to make it simple, cartridge based, cartridge based, most of it, push the button, measurement is done, and data are uploaded. So, and the governments are working on the regulatory pathway and the regulatory guidance on how to do this. It has to be validated side by side. It has to be quality controlled side by side, but so far so good. We are in six sites. It works really well and it works because it's highly standardized, simplified, hands off and, and, and uh, yes, hands off and, and in a GMP quality environment. So what's it, the, is the business model for this different from um, centralized um, CAR-T products? And will, will the price point of it be different from what we're seeing from the traditional CAR T products, yeah, the the principle is not going to be different from a practice perspective. So we, as a company, will get the approval registration. But the difference, of course, is that we decentralize, do the production decentralized, close to the patient. That has many many benefits, especially the fact that you don't need to transport and can treat people in very bad conditions, even with a very short life expectancy. Um, the the uh, the approval will be obtained by us in the end, and then we are responsible locally for the manufacturing, and that is still work in progress with the regulators on how to deal with that. And you, from a cost, it's too early. Uh, it's too early. The fact that we do it decentralized, no no logistics involved or minimal logistics involved, that we can automate a lot in the end. We hope to be able to have a significant cost benefit, but today that's not uh, not the first objective. The first objective is is getting the huge clinical benefit to patients. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, in the long run, is this something that could lead to more of a democratization of CAR T therapies, where you might be able to bring it? 
to patients in middle income countries, for example, where um, it's it's not possible now because of the cost. Yeah. Yeah, in my 30 years of uh, pharmaceutical work and career, it always has been, it starts always as a very complicated intervention. Uh, I started uh, with HIV with 18 pills twice a day, and in the end, it becomes one pill once a day, it becomes available globally, and it reaches many patients. And you hope that that this type of, of science will lead to democratizing uh, across the world and making it more available. But it's not always possible day one. It will take its time, but that's also the goal. How can you have so many more people benefit benefit from uh, from transformational cancer therapies? So at the, at the beginning, um, you mentioned about uh, BD opportunities, and you said basically that, uh, that you're just getting started. Can you talk a little bit about what kinds of um, acquisitions you're looking at? What should we expect? Is it going to be transformational technologies like cell point and abound, or are you going to be looking more for um, specific assets that you can um, develop and at what stage? Yeah, um, both. We have now a cell point, we have now a cell therapy platform, and we hope to uh, to find additional opportunities to develop on the platform. We have the capacity and the capability to do that. Uh, but also, in addition to that, uh, we have good research capabilities now in the biological space. So we'll we'll look at what can we do with biospecifics, uh, maybe in the space of ADC, uh, because it's all around cancer. What, how can you target them hematological, the liquid cancers, but also liquid tumors, but also solid tumors? And there we are building on on we are hoping to build additional platforms to. Uh, to to uh, to tackle that, so uh, really strongly working on on uh, on new opportunities in cancer. But with our uh, we are we have a gateway to 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 patients now with uh, with our CAR T systems, and that attracts a lot of interest from other companies who are looking for opportunity to bring cell therapies to patients. And and I know you're also you're looking at CAR T outside of cancer, right? You've got um, a, a, yes. a program in in lupus. Yes, we are, we started a, a program where we tested uh, we are testing a CAR T and lupus, and there also in immunology or autoimmune diseases there might be some additional space for that. Um, um, on top of what solid tumors could bring, also in immunology there is there is, uh, but it's early on. Huh? So with lupus, the first five patients were published uh, with very good results. Uh, so we are looking into that on how to uh, how to repeat that experiment and build on that. Well, great. Thanks. We're, we're going to take a break now. When we come back, I want to talk to you about these other issues that we talked about. I mentioned at the beginning about um, European innovation, also about the Inflation Reduction Act, global health, and some others. We'll be we'll be right back. The twenty third Bioequity Europe Conference heads to Dublin, Ireland, in May twenty twenty three with a program focused on how to create a new playbook for biotech success in Europe. In 2022, over 800 industry leaders from 30 countries joined Bioequity in Milan, Italy for two plus days of strategic panels, one-to-one -one partnering meetings, and C-level networking. More than 150 biotechs selected by BioCentury presented their story to investors and potential partners. Don't wait. Two of the last three in-person bioequity conferences sold out. Register today and join BioCentury EBD in our Dublin Regional Host Committee at the industry's premier C-suite and investor conference. Visit bioequityeurope.com for more information. I'm back speaking with uh, Dr. Paul Stoffel, CEO of Galapagos. Uh, Dr. Stoffel, you, you are and you have been an advocate for European innovation uh, how do you assess the climate for biopharma in Europe now? I'm, I'm remain very positive. We have gone through ups and downs over 30 years, and uh, always as an industry, we have found solutions for uh, for the challenges uh, which were there. And on in one end, I 
I like it that the interface with government is focused on how can you get access to more patients. And I worked worldwide in HIV, in all time, in TB, in all diseases. And if you have a transformational innovation, how can you bring it to more patients? And so the, the fact that, that it focuses on, on innovative therapies and, and in fact, providing priority to innovative therapies and bring those to more people, I'm not against it. It is, it is a, at the same time, it's a challenge on for small molecules for shortening uh, what, what people are doing with, uh, with the ex exclusivity time, et cetera. But I, I find it an opportunity for us as an industry to show that we are joining in doing our best for bringing the best innovation to patients in the fastest possible way. So, you, so what you're talking about is the, is the, of course, is the leaked drafts of the European pharmaceutical Law yes. um, revision, which which some of your colleagues have been very negative to me about. And they basically said that they, they they say, well, look, it's cutting the IP protections, it's undermining incentives to develop treatments for rare conditions, and um, and it's setting um, an incentive for launching within the whole um, Euro European Union that isn't realistic, especially for small companies. What do you think about any of those? I don't say that there are no challenges, yeah, and and no, and I I don't like uh, some of the the topics uh, either, but 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 at the same time, it's it's uh, it is um, it is a framework which, if you are a young new company in in novice space, you can deal with it, especially if you are bringing transformational products and. Transformational products are still very much, uh, very much in favor. Well, let's say in a positive way, looked at to uh, both by the regulatory agency as by the by the by the countries, and it's up to us as an industry to to manage access and and in collaboration with the payers. It there are challenges in that, um, and if I was in my previous job. At, at, at JNJ, I would say, yes, big challenges because it would challenge a lot of our existing products uh, with shorter life uh, life cycle, et cetera. In my new job, I say, yes, I will work on it. We work on it and make sure that we uh, operate within those challenges and try to uh, make it work, not just in the US, but uh, not just in Europe, but also in the US uh, as we uh, try to, uh, to get to global products. Um, um, yes, the, let me say in Europe, you, you asked to me what what is the environment uh, there is very strong academic science ongoing very strong um, development capabilities in europe the regulators although we have some hiccup i mean in the speed of starting trials now because of all the changes in in, in governance and guidance we have been able to always do very fast and very successful developments here um, we have very good talent who grew up in, in large pharma, small biotechs. So if you look at the overall environment, uh, I think it will remain very productive. Um, whether uh, overcoming those, those new regulations and constraints, uh, I think we'll find positive solutions to it with uh, strong new innovation in cancer, infectious disease, immunology, in all, all different areas. Uh, I like a few things like uh putting in place a voucher for the antibiotic resistance i've been fighting for a long time uh for that uh incentivizing also the more let's say disadvantaged uh fields which which are very difficult to tackle uh they put in uh some they they, they are taking out or putting in some incentives and take out some barriers um but yes in the mainstream business uh we uh, we are going to have a new neg a few negatives but also a few positives i think on on uh, on on facilitating innovative medicines, and and so what what are your thoughts about um, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, you're headquartered in Europe, but you're obviously your global business, and you're going to be looking at uh, presumably um, at, at launching drugs in the United States and perhaps acquiring assets in the United States. What effect do you see the IRA having on your business and and more broadly on um, biopharma? Yeah, I think uh, first as a human being and a person, I think uh, hopefully there is a move to provide more patients with access to medicines in the US uh, and, and, and that 
by uh, by taking away some of the 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 self pay for, of the pay for patients. Uh, uh, also, um, I think um, yes, yeah, uh, providing more access to more patients, I find a positive. Mm -hmm. uh, still, I think the all the elements of accelerating science to the FDA, to the market are still going to be there. So they won't affect us in the first next 10 years, uh, I think. So I, I'm staying positive as a bio biotech company that we will be able to bring innovation to the US as before. The longer term, if you have a business today in the US and your ex extent, your your life expansion, um, your exclusivity is shortened, that's that's of course cutting in your existing business. At the moment, uh, we don't have that, so I I can't complain about that because we are launching new products, and I'm mainly looking at that. How can we bring new products, transformation, new products to the US market uh, in a uh, in a in an in let's say. A, in a, in, a, in a fast way i think there is not much in the way of doing that for me it's like time to result on the market and and then growth in the market i expect that that if we bring a transformation oncology product we'll still have the benefits from the market it, it, it's it's suffering in the longer term on some of the value and that will have impact on value of pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies but uh, with access to more people i think we'll compensate for that and and um, does it on the kind of the flip side? Does it create opportunities for you? Because you said you know it's going to have impacts on the um, valuation of companies and on assets. Does it create opportunities for you to acquire um, companies or acquire um, mm -hmm. assets? Well, I think I don't think whether it's a consequence of IRA or some. It, it, I think it's more the consequence on the economic uh, problems at the moment in the world and and uh, started with the. Uh, with the financial crisis and and the war in Ukraine, etc., um, that that caused to the the drop of the the valuation of biotech companies. That is absolutely an opportunity for us. Uh, companies have different di difficulties to raise money, um, and many companies need money. There is very good innovation in the market, which which wants to partner, and there uh, we have the balance sheet to do that. And that gives us an opportunity to accelerate value creation. Um, yes, uh, that that that's what we see today. We are approached. Uh, we get inbound call, a lot of inbound calls on collaboration, and uh, we have more. It's a it's a buyer's market, you know. Um, well, that's interesting. And and do you think that you know one of the things that sounds like you're suggesting is that there's going to be a um, a faster turnover. Um, of innovation, if companies have to get their uh, have a shorter period of exclusivity in the United States, and perhaps it's going to happen in Europe also, that to compensate, one of the things they're going to have to do is to get quicker at yes. launching new, new products. Do you think that that's a, is that is that realistic? Is that going to happen? Yeah, it's realistic in a way that we have seen this before, and you know that at a certain point we had these long tails on on products with with uh, when there were exclusive uh, exclusivity was lost. We still were able to sell three, four, five, six years. Uh, that in at a certain point became zero one week after one 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 week after loss of exclusivity. And we adapted to that. And and when I was at, uh, with with our Janssen teams in those days, we we looked at um, how can we accelerate innovation. First of all, by the choice of the fields we work in: high medical need, unmet need, life saving, years of life save, qual save quality of life. And then we accelerated our programs by by program management and making sure that we counted days and and hours instead of weeks and years. And we were able to accelerate product development. So it will put an innovation uh, on the development side to uh, to accelerate new products and then yeah also on efficiency today with with all the the electronic systems with uh, with new ways of doing clinical trial we should further optimize that that we can do clinical trials recruitment faster in having the right patients on a global basis uh, read out faster get make sure that the overall process of that accelerates and if we do that well and then we can do more products in a certain time frame and and compensate for the growth but it require uh, for the for supporting the growth it will require investment in r d 
innovative mindsets on how to deal with it, uh, both with the regulators and with the companies. And uh, I think we'll, uh, as an as an industry, we'll we'll find the answer to that. Uh, we should find the answer to that. Well, I want to switch over to another policy issue, which I know is something you've uh, had a longstanding interest in, which is global health. One of the things that uh, came up in the pandemic was a concern about inequitable access to um, pandemic therapies in developing countries and in developed countries. One set of ideas that came up about that is around IP, including treaties that would um, require that companies share their IP for certain products um, uh, at no cost with, uh, with manufacturers in developing countries. What, what's your thought about that? Is that one, is, is IP, is patent protection really the rate limiting factor for um, getting these kinds of therapies to developing countries and um, is um, mandatory uh, relinquishment of IP around uh, pandemic yeah. products a good idea or a bad idea? During COVID, IP would not have played a role at all, at all in, in order to accelerate time to market, yes. Uh, so um, it was more the experience which teams had before on doing that type of work in the vaccine world or in direct development to accelerate to the extreme uh, medicine and vaccine development. Uh, for us at J&J, it took us uh, from 10th of January to uh, to end of the year to, to do um, to, to develop that vaccine and it was like the the ex excellence uh in the teams who had done cancer drug and and and, T and hiv drugs before who were able to the to to count every hour every day in the process and shorten the shorten this time continuously and so we ended up being able to do it in 12 months IP didn't play a role at all. Um, everyone could have run away with their IP, but nobody would be able to do that product development in 12 months. It would have taken other companies for three, four, five years, even if they had the IP. So I'm not a believer that IP is, is the challenge. It's it's um, IP is needed uh, to protect and, and give people the opportunity to develop technology. If IP is taken away from technology, Ooh. nobody will develop it. And that's that is that is uh, why I'm like, uh, when a product is fully in place, like with HIV, and, and you then deliberately decide, let's give it to generic manufacturers to make it available for like in HIV, it, 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 brought, um, it, it brought access to the world, but it didn't accelerate time to having those medicine. The access to the world is a deliberate decision. What we did and at the Anson with, with HIV, we give, we give the license to uh, a free license or 1% license, whatever it was, to, uh, to a developing country producer. And then it, they made it available at cost or even, uh, and that that worked very well for HIV. Um, we did that in tuberculosis with tiered pricing, uh, which was uh, public, almost tenfold difference between the uh, between high, middle, high income, middle income, low income. And that was a way to give access. And in COVID, we decided to do it at not for profit uh, in JNJ from the beginning to avoid the problem with uh, with the with the access. Um, but IP would not have made a difference. So I am a very big proponent to make sure IP stays in place to uh, to allow people invest in technology and and bring it to the point. There was for our platform, the Persis 6 and the A26, it was probably 20 years of investment to the point we made the COVID vaccine. Yeah, We did Zika, we did Ebola, we did uh, influenza, a lot of different vaccines before uh, in, in research development. And it's built on that experience that we do, could do COVID. So if the IP of, of the R26 platform would not have been there, never would have happened. Yeah. So, well, yeah. That so is, one, uh, one of the other things I wonder from your perspective, because you've seen so much, it, at the beginning of the pandemic, you could have looked at it and said, well, look, the whole world's going to come together. You know, we've got this existential threat. It really is. It was an existential threat. At least people felt it was. That the whole world would come together and get behind science and get behind um, accelerating the development of vaccines and therapies and so on. That, that's not what happened at all. It, it really, especially in the United States, it tore the country apart, you know, and it's created uh, an environment now where there's less trust in science, there's less confidence um, in companies than there was to start with. 
What do you think can be done, if anything, to get that trust that gets society's trust in science and in the companies that um, create medicines back? Yeah, it, it is, um, it's unfortunate that the trust suffered there, but, but it was really essential and necessary to save my mom, probably many of your family members, to get back out of, um, of of isolation because the vaccine was there and people could survive. So it was a technical, let's say, intervention, a technical medical intervention the world needed to make to protect against the pandemic. And unfortunately, that went with a lot of loss of trust because people thought we went too fast. But at the same time, it, it was a decent process, both uh, governed by the US FDA and by the European agency and by other agencies in the world, where there was no shortcut at all. Um, and and all the all the science was was seriously vetted. We with our rector were already on the go for 20 years uh, in, in, in the discovery and development of that. Um, I think the world came together on developing it together. I I, I still rem remember this fantastic time that that the FDA was available on call, EMA was available on call. We could work, del deliver a file Saturday afternoon, three o'clock to the FDA, four o'clock they were working, three o'clock they would start working on it and 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 have an answer on Monday uh, on the next step in the clinical trial. That this happened never before on how the world worked together. On the different drugs, uh, what happened between 20 companies, the NIH and, and, and the industry, was that, that 25 drugs were tested within a 24-month time frame on whether they could find an, a medicine. Yeah, And that was done uh, pro bono. It was like, hey, everyone was at a meeting two times a month with Francis Collins, myself, and uh, we were co-chairing that and the heads of industry, the heads of government, EMA was there, FDA was there. It was the world really coming together to save the world. Yeah, and, and that was, nobody ever talked about money. It was all about the science. How can we accelerate here in the benefit of the world, um, this, this uh, both the vaccines and the drugs? So um, the world came together to save the world. That 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 the trust there was probably lost to a certain extent, but at the same time, I think we saved probably millions of lives by doing what we did do with uh, with the community. So it's my my view on this and my experience through this uh, very challenging uh, 12, 18 months. It it is fascinating. Yeah, you you had a a front row seat. You know, at the most important. Yeah, I uh, I was I was. I was chairing the industry side, Francis was chairing the government side, and together we we governed the process of, of uh, 30, 50 people on the phone every second week. And people were, we did six platform trials where 24, 25 drugs were tested. And uh, and somewhere from industry, industry was was working with the government to find the studies to do, um, besides the vaccines, because that was another we used the U.S. government uh, viral 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 network in the world. It was, in fact, the HIV clinical trial network. Probably most people don't know there are 200 sites in the world who are connected to each other and with the NIH to do this network. And so we did, and they are U.S., South America, South Africa. And we, we were able to start these sites uh, within one month, 200 sites in the world. We had military planes, we had the private jets from j and we had everyone going around to drop these packages with vaccines. They were, they were trained, people got their protocols, their ethical committees. And in the end, we were able to recruit 50, 60,000 people in six weeks in a clinical trial because of a big investment uh, between government and ourselves. Um, and never seen before, uh, Steve, on, on having that done. I could uh, talk for hours about on, on what was needed. Um, and then as a next step, we were in South Africa. In South Africa, it showed that the South Africa contributed significantly. And then they had a new strain in South Africa, and our vaccine showed to work on the strain. And the government asked to vaccinate all the healthcare workers. So in six weeks, we vaccinated 500,000 healthcare workers. They all showed up in the weekends, uh, 10,000 at a time. And uh, we, we have planes flying, bringing the vaccines over. 
the local community being organized and that study served for us as a big safety study to uh, to measure uh, the safety and efficacy uh, in the South African health um, in the healthcare workers they have an electronic medical record we could capture the data we had the safety the efficacy and uh, they added another 500,000 people to the to the file so this was a really uh, if you ask did the world come together yeah and it was Ramaphosa who got the first vaccine. <laughs> and and and, um, and, uh, and 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 where do you see things now? Because it's 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 very difficult to kind of understand, even for people that follow it, where we are in the pandemic and where we are in the response. You know. Yeah, I think we are we are done with the pandemic. Um, but it's like with influenza, you're done until the next train comes. So um i think omicron did a lot of good to the world because it was a strain which was not very pathologic and still gave everyone a good boost yeah including myself and uh, so we had all three or four vaccines then omicron and that did the job to uh, to protect us all until there is the next uh, the next round um uh, also i think china I think 80% of people got COVID in a, in a month in China, uh, and and we don't we will never know how many deaths uh, there would be. I think it, uh, it I am going to use the wrong, but it, it many many uh, elderly people will must have died many yeah, many like right, in yeah. our, our communities, but because of that infection you have got your protection and so I think we are done with the pandemic, um, uh, not for the elderly. Uh, with with bad immunity, uh, so I'll make sure my mom get her vaccine again. Um, if not, my mom of ninety two will get her vaccine, but I think we uh, we can be reasonably okay now. Yeah, uh, but we forget we forgot about it already, and yeah? nobody uh, it's gone, it's long gone, and and uh, the old preparation for the next pandemic is 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 i'm not involved that much anymore but but uh i don't see i will don't don't see the infrastructure maintained to do it another time it will uh it, no, the thing, and, and i think i think the problem is is that when it comes up again there'll also be resistance there'll be more resistance to to accepting public health measures and more resistance to accepting medical countermeasures than there was this yeah time. but it will be to the detriment of of the individuals who resist because um yeah it it, it you yeah if you don't control as a, a human you can resist but you don't control uh, in the days of the pest the day of tb the day of of COVID or influenza you are subject to it and if you resist because you're different minded and say hey i'm opposed to vaccines yeah thank you very much but then you have the consequence i have seen polio patients in africa i have seen measles patients in africa i have seen the consequences of non vaccination in africa on the ground which was causing huge damage yeah and all these people who pro protest now covid they have had 25 vaccines where they were kids which have protected them already from 10 diseases before they get at the age of 10. yeah uh, and they could have been dead 10 times already that was already taken out by vaccines people forget that mm -hmm. um small kids with tetanus uh, when they are born in the field and they uh, they come in the hospital with tetanus all dead yeah um that's yeah you have to work in Kinshasa for a year, and then you know what vaccines mean. Yeah, so <laughs> good vaccination means yeah, um, yellow fever, um, uh, all of that. If all solved by vaccines, and people still think that they can fight vaccines because it might do something wrong with your body, I'm like, come on, guys, vaccines saved your life already ten times before you could spot, you could you could talk. Yeah. Um, well, 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 thank you, Dr. Stoffels. That's that's all the time we've got today, but I, I really appreciate your thoughts and I thank all of you for, um, for watching. Uh, thank you for this interview. The BioCentury Show is brought to you by BioEquity Europe. BioEquity is Europe's premier international showcase for financial dealmakers and biopharma executives to meet rising biotechs.